Today is going to be a review of all the material we've covered in Survey 1. It is not intended to be a substitution for reading the textbook or attending lectures, and there may be material on the exam that is not covered in the review. We started off with the roles of the artist, and there were four of them. Uh, the first one is artists help us see the world in new and innovative ways. My example for this was Christo and Jean-Claude's work called The Gates. This took place in 2005. It was located in New York City's Central Park. And the idea of these orange curtains was that it made us re-examine our world around us, our landscape. And even though we may have been familiar with Central Park, all of a sudden this work, as one critic said, jars us out of our complacency. The second role of the artist is documentation. An artist's job is to record the world. And it's really cool to see images of the past whether it's a person such as Napoleon, an event such as the burning of the Houses of Parliament, or even a scene such as this one, which is the Rocky Mountains. The third role of the artist is that artists give form to the immaterial. And to me, this is the most difficult job for an artist to have because now we have to put in physicality ideas and spiritual forces that are more transcendental. One of the examples I talked about was how we create our version of God. And in the West, a lot of us deal with Michelangelo's version, which is atop the Sistine ceiling in the Vatican. The fourth role of the artist is that artists make things beautiful. And for most of us, this is what we need an artist to do. We want to look and see and be surrounded by beautiful things. Now, not all artists are going to be able to accomplish this as we move into modern art in a later class. We've got modern art, abstraction, cubism, such as Picasso's work here. We talked about prehistoric art. And with prehistoric art, we had the Paleolithic and the Neolithic eras. The Paleolithic ranges from 40,000 BC on up to 8,000 BC. During this time, man is a hunter-gatherer. The shelters that we live in are temporary, and we don't have any domestication of animals or crops. We are not farming at this time. The Neolithic era changes us. This is when the earth starts to warm and we have this time period from 8,000 down to 2,000 BC. We start to see the rise of the major civilizations such as Egypt during this age and we become more agrarian. We start to live in small cities of seven to 10,000 people. We have domestication of animals. Shelters become more permanent. In painting, we looked at several locations, but most of the cave paintings that have been found are in the north of Spain and along the southwestern corner of France in what's called the Ardici mountain chain. Altamira was the very first cave that was found in 1879. And you can see from this diagram below that all the figures of the animals are strewn throughout the cave. There's very few at the cave entrance. And so this is one of the reasons that we really look at these figures being of monumental importance, whether it's religious or ceremonial. Most of the cave figures, of course, are going to be two-dimensional and re relying heavily on outline. We also have some images from Peck Merle, where they actually use some of the rock outcroppings to form the figures. 
The cave of Lascaux is among the most famous. In fact, today we would consider it the second most famous cave find. First discovered in 1940, these cave paintings date back to around 16,000 BC. And this is also the home to the famous Hall of Bulls. Uh, this figure here is the largest cave painting of an individual animal. It ranges roughly 18 feet from the horns down to the hind legs. But in the 1990s, we have the cave at Chevet. And this cave has figures that date back to over 30,000 BC. And what's different about this cave is that these works look more modeled. They show recessive space. They seem to be in perspective, which is something we didn't figure out until the 1400s AD. But what it makes us do is rewrite these early chapters in history books, because we used to think that as man developed, so did our artistic ability. But in this case, we can say that man had the same amount of artistic skill as we do. Also during the Neolithic era, we have what's called rock shelter art. Now, most of the cave paintings come from the Paleolithic time, but rock shelter art is Neolithic and it's gonna be more exposed to the elements. So not as much is going to exist today, but we can see some of the figures there at the middle right of the screen. As far as sculpture goes during this age, the sculpture is going to be very small. Lion human is one of those figures that challenges us because it is so large in comparison with other figures. This is a foot tall and this would be considered gigantic as far as prehistoric sculptures are concerned. It also fulfills that third role of the artist that artists have to have the power of imagination. This figure is not only half human, but also half animal. And these early works, of course, they're gonna be made with stone or ivory. And this is one of the oldest finds ever, dating back to 30,000 BC. We also have one of the icons of prehistoric art, the woman of Wielendorf, the woman of Brassenpoi, And when we move into architecture, the first thing we want to talk about is how these structures are built. And when we talk about the shell system, this is what we're going to see as far as architecture goes during the whole duration of our course, where we have one basic building material that provides both the structural support and the outer covering of the building. When we get to modern architecture in the 1850s, we're going to see the development of the skeleton and skin system. So early on, we had these mammoth bone houses, and this is Paleolithic architecture, where early man uses bones from animals and such. And of course, these tusks from woolly mammoths make great entrances to these basically tent-like structures. They're roughly 15 feet in diameter and then they're insulated by the hide or fur of the animal. When we look at Neolithic architecture, we have the settlement at Scarabray, which is off the coast of Scotland in the Orkney Islands. And we have the, a couple of really cool ideas here. The first one is that we've got corbeling where we've got these flat stones set around the circumference of the building. Each layer is pushed in slightly, so it's going to connect toward the very top, almost like a tent or a hut would. And here we have some imagery of corbeling. This happens to be underneath the ground, and this is taken from the Anasazi Indians. But the idea is that this works as a very crude form of arch. And it allows an area inside of unsupported space, roughly 15 to 20 feet in diameter. The largest corbelled structure in the world we'll look at later on in this review, and that was only 45 feet in diameter. 
also against the back wall here, that bookcase looking object is done with the post and lintel system. Again, something we'll see in various forms of architecture where we have the posts supporting the lintel and the lintel strong enough and heavy enough to keep the posts situated in an upright position. Stonehenge is built with the post and lintel structure. And this is also the most famous megalithic of all time. And currently, we consider it the most complex. There are some other ones that are beginning to rival it, such as Avebury. This is also a location that's been built on again and again through successive generations. And that most of the time period can be traced back to 2500 BC on up to about 1600 BC. From there, we talked about art theft, looting, and repatriation. Some reasons that stealing art has become so popular is, of course, the amount of money these objects are worth, the relative ease in terms of stealing them, the size and shape of these artworks make them conducive to stealing, and also the general lack of enforcement around these objects. But we do have some areas that are helping us return and find lost and stolen art, such as the LAPD's Art Theft Detail, Interpol, the International Police Agency, and the Art Loss Register. This is a database that auction houses are required to search before putting an object up for sale. But we have some startling statistics, such as that art theft is the third highest grossing criminal activity following drugs and weapons. And sadly, only about 10% of stolen art is ever recovered. Traffickers receive about 10 cents on the dollar. We talked about some art thieves, such as Napoleon, who stole art from not only European countries, but also North Africa, such as Egypt. One of the figures he stole was this one, Lawakawan and his sons. He stole this from Italy. We also talked about Hitler as an art thief. And when we look back at his reign over Germany, we see a lot of these buildings built, especially for the 1936 Olympic Games in Berlin, done in the Greco-Roman style. So we can say that Hitler not only was a classicist, but he also absolutely hated modern art. And he called this type of artwork degenerate, meaning that it lost the physical, mental, or moral qualities considered to be normal and desirable. That this art showed an evidence of decline. The Degenerate Art Act of 1937 allows Nazi troops to go into Germany's state museums to cleanse them of works that Hitler deemed as poisonous, and museums didn't have any choice but to relinquish their collections. Within a period of two weeks, Nazi troops gathered up 16,000 artworks, took them to Switzerland, and sold them at auction for really fire sale prices. 11,000 of those artworks sold at that auction, another 5,000 of those works were destroyed. And don't forget the story with this painting here. This is the portrait of Adela Block Bauer. It was confiscated by the Nazis when this lady's husband, Ferdinand, uh, fled from Austria once Austria had been annexed to Germany. Uh, he is going to die in exile, and when the war is over, the, this painting and the four others were turned over to the National Museum in Austria. In the early 2000s, the family waged a lawsuit against Austria, fought and got these paintings back, and turned around and sold them at auction. And here are the other four paintings that the Blockbauer family also owned. These were also by Gustav Klimt. We talked about other paintings such as The Astronomer by Vermeer, the self-portrait of Raphael. Uh, it's called Portrait of a Young Man, but it is a self-portrait of Raphael. 
one of the great Renaissance artists, and there are only three self-portraits done by this artist. This was last seen in the Nazi uh, governor of Poland's possession in January of 1945. It has not been seen since, and it's considered the most important artwork still missing from the war. We also talked about the Ghent altarpiece being the most frequently stolen work of art produced, stolen, over thir stolen 13 times over its 600 year existence. And this painting, Rembrandt's Storm on the Sea of Galilee, which was stolen from the Isabella Stuart Gardner Museum on March 18, 1990. It marks the largest art heist on American soil. From here, we talked about the ancient Near East, in the area mostly between the Tigris and Euphrates River, the Fertile Crescent. This is also during the time of the Neolithic Age. And we had a lot of cool things invented in this area of the world, such as the wheel and plow, irrigation techniques were developed, writing, as in cuneiform, beer, the development of schools, libraries, and written laws. Unfortunately, the biggest disadvantage of this area was political instability and a lot of warfare. We can see how the Sumerians are going to be taken over by the Akkadians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, and the Persians. In Sumeria, we had the advancement of writing with cuneiform. We also had the development of the earliest cities, such as Jericho. Most of these cities would have been made of mud brick. There would have been fortification laws, uh, fortification um, rings around the city. The walls would have been 20 feet high and roughly five feet thick. We also have ziggurats. These are also made of mud brick and they raised the temple that would sit on top of them away from any flooding and would also bring it closer to the heavens. And as you would imagine, religion plays a very significant role in this civilization. Note also where it's located within the city, right in the central city administration area. And inside the temple, you would generally have votive figures that would represent God, such as the largest figure here is Abu, the god of vegetation. But the smaller figures are representations of us, the common people. And we would set these idols in toward, facing toward the larger gods. And some of them would be inscribed with our names, others prayers. And when we were at work, these gods, these votive figures would take our place, praying to the gods. We also had the Vorka vase, which is the first time we have a narrative in art history. And besides Jericho, we also have the city of Ein Gazal, and that's where we get these types of figures. They're roughly three feet in height. There's been nearly 40 of them found and they're made completely different than prehistoric sculpture is. Prehistoric sculpture is made through the subtractive method, taking a block of material and carving away unwanted pieces. Here, we're building up in a network of reeds and twine, and then wet plaster is applied on top of that. The eyes are shells, and then the pupils are made from elements of bitumen, which is an asphalt compound. We have these great cylinder seals, the bullheaded harp, once again telling us a narrative. In the Akkadian Empire, we have the head of the Akkadian ruler, um, which is one of the few bronze pieces to survive since antiquity. Most of the bronze images, sculptures, would have been melted down and repurposed. We can also say that the figure's eyes and ears were gouged out 
perhaps ceremoniously, uh, to kill any power that this sculpture had. And this is made with the lost wax casting method, which allows us to create a hollow sculpture. And this is important. Um, it is developed during the Bronze Age, which begins around 2500 BC. And it's for lighter weight sculptures using less rare material, and therefore it's less expensive to create these works. We also have the stele of Naram Sen. Now, a stele is usually considered an upright slab of rock. Most of the time you're going to see them between six feet, seven feet in height. This one shows the Akkadian ruler defeating the people of the Zagros Mountains, which are located in southern Iran. It's a cool work because it shows us a military victory, and it's the first time we see this in art. It also shows hierarchical scale, which we can see that Naram Sin is two to three times as large as any of his troops following him. The stars up above are representations of gods, and this also places the king closer to these figures. Don't forget to study the, the Gedea of Lagash, who we also, in class, did a compare and contrast. In the Babylonian Empire, we have the Stele of Hammurabi, which is, again, one of those iconic images of art. It's a record of decisions and decrees that were made during Hammurabi uh, during his reign, and there's something like 1,500 different um, entries here. 300 of them have been decoded, and the punishments depended upon social standing and gender and, of course, the severity of the crime. But what's important really for us artistically is at the top surface where we see Hammurabi receiving the, bless the blessing of the sun god. And this, again, lets us know that the king is in direct contact with the gods of the civilization. In the Assyrian Empire, we just looked at this really cool relief image. This would have been on the inside of the fortification walls. And this is Ashurbanipal hunting lions. And remember that a relief image is only seen from one side. And here we've got the king killing lions in a very, you know, manly type of state. However, this is a very controlled environment. There was no harm at all would have come to the king. Only one lion was set out in this controlled environment at a time. And you also have the individuals behind the lion who were there to protect the king just in case if the lion got a little bit too close. From there, we went to the Egyptian civilization. And of course, the Egyptian civilization resides along the Nile River. Water is the key component to these early civilizations, such as we saw in the Middle East with the Tigris and the Euphrates. And remember, as far as location goes, Upper Egypt is actually in the lower part of the image, and Lower Egypt is in the upper part of the image. And think about it as the way that the Nile flows toward the delta, toward the Mediterranean. You do want to know the chronology of this era. We start off with the pre-dynastic, that means before any of the kings or pharaohs. We have the Old Kingdom the Middle Kingdom, and the New Kingdom. And between all of the kingdoms, there's also these what are called intermediate periods where we have some political instability. Some vocabulary you need to know. Dynasty, succession of rulers of the same family. So for instance, uh, Akhenaten, Nefertiti, and King Tutankhamun, they're all the same dynasty because they're all related. Kingdoms are groups of dynasties that share cultural characteristics. And then we also talked already about the intermediate periods. With the pre-dynastic era, we have the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt led by King Narmer, and he's going to become the very first pharaoh. Make sure you're familiar with the palette of King Narmer, about the imagery that it shows, the different narratives that are present here and the ways that we can consider how Upper and Lower Egypt come together.
Egypt is also the first civilization that gives us ideal proportions. And during the Old Kingdom, this is probably the most famous because this is where we have the Great Pyramids. We also have mastabas, which are tomb structures. They are reserved for the rich and the powerful. Um, they are historically one story tall with slanted sides. They're kind of like a miniature ziggurat. However, in the case of the Pyramid of Djoser, um, this is mastaba on top of mastaba and there's various levels. And so you can see again how similar they are to ziggurats, which are pictured at the left. And we have the Great Pyramids during this age. And of course, one of the pyramids is named for Khafre. And you also want to make sure you're familiar with this sculpture. Again, it was part of the compare and contrast that we did uh, against the Gudea of Lagash. This is a five and a half foot sculpture sitting down. It is made of anthoracite which uh, we used to think it was diorite, but it's a little bit different rock. And when it's put out into the sun, it actually grow, glows kind of this purplish haze to it. We have the god Horus behind the king, and his wings are, are very much protecting the king's head. The association here is that with the god, the king is a relative, and he is what's called a semi-divine status. Down below, we've got the lotus and papyrus plants. Again, the association between Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt coming together as one country. We have the normal regalia that this individual wears. And this is a very difficult stone to carve, so it is completely positive in terms of space. There's no negative areas. King Menkari and his wife, this is also one of the pharaohs that gets a pyramid on the Giza Plateau. We have some emotion here with his wife uh, putting her arm around his waist. We also have this idea of movement as one foot is stepping in front of the other. Again, the idea that we're in, the king is in his normal regalia. There is an ideal um, look to the king. It is not individualized. And here with this work, we can see that we're starting to use a different material. This is alabaster. It's easier to carve, and we do have a sculpture, even though it's very geometric, it does include some negative space, some empty space, or some voids between, for instance, the arm and her body, or between the legs and the throne. A seated scribe is kind of a cool work. It is on the smaller side, and it is much more individualized than the true ideals that we see that the pharaohs presented in. We have a papyrus scroll in the left hand and what would have been a pen in his right. The figure is heavy set, um, more middle-aged, and a scribe is also going to be someone who was highly educated. And then we have the Middle Kingdom. I just put in some items here of jewelry and of faience. And faience is earthenware. It is a type of pottery or ceramics that's not fired at very high temperatures in a kiln, and in turn, it's, it's very easily breakable. This hippopotamus is cool because remember, hippopotamus are dangerous. I mean, this is uh, the animal that killed King Narmer, and it's really kind of cool. It's gonna damage crops too. Um, it is cool because it's in blue, uh, so it's kind of like hiding in the water, and it's got images of lotus on its surface. And then we have the New Kingdom, and we have one of the female pharaohs, Hatshepsut. 
And remember, this is a person who keeps her son uh, off of the throne for about 20 years. And when the son does become Pharaoh, he destroys a lot of the works that she created, scrapes her name off of all the um, sculptures and objects. But she was overall a very good leader for Egypt. This is also the time where we have King Akhenaten. And all of a sudden we go from this polytheistic civilization, this polytheistic society, to one of monotheism. So now we're praying just to one God, the sun God. And keep in mind, this is again another great compare and contrast between Khafre and Akhenaten. The sculpture is very tall, it's more curvilinear, and it's a lot more perhaps natural compared to something of the ideal that we see at the left. Akhenaten is married to Nefertiti, and they were considered co-rulers of Egypt. We had read the article about her. And this is perhaps possibly the most beautiful woman in Egypt. The sculpture that we see is very symmetrical. The figure has a long neck and high cheekbones and she's beautiful and she's powerful. We also spoke a little bit about Tutankhamun and the exhibits that we saw in Los Angeles, both in 1976 and in 2005. He is the last of his family dynasty, and he's going to rule for a short time, roughly eight or nine years, and he's going to die fairly young. Overall, he's um, not a significant king, but the reason he is significant is because his tomb was undisturbed until 1922. With Egypt under foreign rule, we see that the Romans have conquered Egypt right around the time of Alexander the Great. And we have these really cool, very multicultural artworks, these mummy portraits. And these were originally done in encaustic paint. And encaustic is one of the oldest painting mediums. We're gonna see these used during the Greeks, the Romans, and of course, right now, the Egyptians. It is pigment mixed with hot wax. And as you can imagine how quickly the artist has to work, before the wax cools. But even the ancient Greek sculptures that we'll look at shortly would have had encaustic painted over the surface of them. While you were alive, your image would be painted and then cut to shape for the outer wrappings of the mummy. So with these, their style is definitely Greek, which is what the Romans copied. Uh, it is during the Roman time period, and the use is Egyptian, as the Greeks and Romans would cremate their dead rather than mummify them. Now we're going to move on to the Aegean culture. Unlike previous cultures we have studied, which were landlocked, this civilization relied on the sea. And we have three distinct areas that we're going to look at. The Cycladic Islands, the island of Crete, and then the Greek mainland. So here's a map of that area we're going to be focusing on. And first we're going to look at the Cycladic Islands. The Cyclads are where we have our very first sculptures made from marble. They're very much like the figures of Ein Gazal in that they were found in cemeteries laying on top of graves and perhaps giving a personification of the person who was buried. These would have been dressed up, painted, hair attached, but the figures themselves are very plain, unadorned. You could even call them abstract, but we've got definitely some lifelike figures here, especially with the one on the left where the figure's head is kind of thrown back as he's playing a harp. We have both positive and negative space introduced to these areas. And it's really great because marble is one of those mediums that is really easy to carve. 
And these perhaps even inspired the modernist artists like Brancusi in the early 20th century. When we move south of the Cyclades, we have the gigantic island of Crete. And Crete is about 130 miles from east to west and about 36 miles from north to south at the widest part. But up near the center middle is the palace at Knossos. And this is what we believed it looked like. Uh, today, it looks like this. But it was found by Sir Arthur Evans in the late 1800s. And this is one of those locations that was built on again and again and again. At the palace at Knossos, we have our very first fresco painting which is called bull jumping or sometimes called the Toreador fresco, where most likely this is some rite of passage of an individual who jumps over this bull. Fresco painting actually comes from the Italian word for fresh, which is meaning that the plaster that's going to be applied to the wall that's going to be painted is freshly applied and the artist has a very short time in which to work, about 10 to 12 hours. The pigment that he's going to use is emulsified in lime water and then painted onto the plaster. And when the plaster dries, it becomes part of the wall itself and it will last for as long as the wall does. Fresco is normally done during the summer months it's normally painted from the top down to prevent dripping on already finished sections. We do have a limited color palette because not all the colors are going to be water soluble. And fresco painting is very slow and it is very methodical. But when we look at later work, such as the Sistine Chapel ceiling, it is as perfect as it was 500 years ago when it was first painted. And this is one of the frescoes that we see on the Aegean, uh, on the island of Crete. And with this work here, it's also very much focused on nature. It's not so much focused on humans, but definitely that natural component, that landscape component is here. The snake goddess is one of the sculptures that was found in a storeroom. And it is faience also, just like the hippopotamus that we saw during the Egyptian civilization. The octopus flask is one of those famous works also found on the island of Crete and it's used in all the history books and it's just one of those cool things where the octopus is perfectly situated for this shape of vessel. And harvester vase which is one of my favorites. It's about the size of a shot glass. It is egg-shaped and originally would have been covered in gold leaf. We have yet to find one of these that is perfectly intact, but what amazes me is that there's like 27 figures around the circumference of this object and they all look happy and there's an audible tone here as if they're singing as they're going on to some festival or harvest. When we look at the Greek mainland, this is where we have the Mycenaean culture. And compared to the Cycladic culture and the Minoan culture, which we find on the island of Crete, the Mycenaean culture is very warlike. And we can see that just from the citadel that's here. We can see the fortification walls. And particularly, we're interested at the very bottom of this image. We see that round circular area that is called Grave Circle A where we have shaft graves, and just to the left of that along the pathway is the famed Lion's Gate. And this is the entrance into the citadel at Mycenae. It is done with the post and lintel construction system. And to give you an idea of height, these lions on top of the lintel are about nine and a half feet tall. Their faces stolen many centuries ago because they were carved in either bronze or gold. But the shaft graves that we see are not going to be looted very easily. And this is where we really uncover a lot of archaeological items and objects that are very worthwhile, such as the funerary mask of Agamemnon. And we also have 
Another way of burial is above ground burials, and these are called tholos tombs. And the largest one was called the Treasury of Atreus. And this is the largest corbelled structure that we have. It's roughly 45 feet in diameter. And unfortunately, nothing has ever been found inside one of these types of tombs. And of course, compared to the shaft graves, these were very easily looted. The last image we're gonna look at for the Aegean culture is the Vafio cup. When the Minoan culture ends, roughly around the year of 1400, 1500 BC, we have some of their relics still on the Greek mainland. We're not sure what happened to their culture, but they could have been uh, taken over by the Mycenaeans, or there could have been natural disasters, and they naturally moved to the mainland. We just don't know. But the Vafio cup is made out of pure gold. This is a type of relief sculpture called repousse, where the piece is hammered on one side of it, and that forms the image on the other side. There's only been about six or eight of these cups found, and they are called Vafio cups because they were found in the city of Vafio. As we transition into Greek art, this is one of the major cultures that we have. It's something that we look back upon as one of the most endearing uh, cultures for their achievements. The Romans are going to keep Greek art and culture alive and spread it throughout their kingdom with this term called Hellenism. And we'll see that in our early chapters after the midterm. Even the Italian Renaissance artists are gonna look back at Greek civilization as a high point of artistic achievement. This is the beginning of the classical age and they're gonna bring into use many of the techniques such as the contrapposto stance that's going to disappear after the fall of Rome. The Greeks not only contribute to art, but also politics, literature, math, and science. It was definitely a man's society. Women were there to run the household and to prepare the meals. Other than that, they were really to keep out of sight. Marriages were arranged by the woman's father, and then she would fall under control of her husband. Greece was also a polytheistic culture, and their gods take on the form of humans. And we did this exercise in class where we talked about 15 of the most important gods. When the Romans conquer Greece, we're going to see the same gods, but their names are going to be changed. We have four distinct periods, the geometric or orientalizing period, the archaic period, classical, and Hellenistic. With the geometric period, this is where we have works like the Dipylon vase, where we definitely have some abstract imagery on its surface. This was named the Dipylon vase because it was found in the Dipylon Cemetery. And the official classification for this two-handled jar is called a crater. And this is a fairly large work. It's about three feet tall. It was reassembled from broken pieces, but it gives us a very clear narrative. And this would have been of a cremation. This entire vase would have stood very much like a grave marker. And there were holes drilled into the base of this vase. And if you went to the grave of your departed friend, you would bring some wine and you would drink some of the wine and you would pour some of the wine into this vase and it would leach into the ground so you could be still sharing a drink with your departed friend. But on the surface here in the upper register, we can see a person lying down being cremated with others on either side pulling their hair out in anguish. And down below, we have a funerary processional with soldiers and chariots and horses. Again, very much in abstract form and very two-dimensional as well. When we get to the archaic period, we have that famous archaic smile that's present. And this is a Koros sculpture 
or just a sculpture of a young man. Again, this would have been serving as a grave marker. The face itself, very abstract, almond-shaped eyes, and the figure, again, I would consider it ideal. It's not something that is individualized. We also have sculptures of female individuals, and these are called cores. Uh, and this one, uh, the Peplos Kore, is named so because of the tunic that she's wearing. And these all would have been painted in encaustic paint, usually very bright, very gaudy colors. You want to make sure you know the orders of Greek architecture, the Doric, the Ionic, and the Corinthian. The Doric order is very plain and unadorned. The Ionic order is noted by the swirls or uh, volettes on either side of the main uh, column. And then the most famous is the Corinthian at the right. And this is where we have um, the most ornamental forms. Usually it's acanthus leaves, but sometimes it can be rosettes as well. The Doric order is the oldest of the orders and it originates around 600 BC. So we see the very oldest temples uh, being, being constructed using this method. It is identified by the lack of ornamentation at the top of the capital. And when we look at the Parthenon, this is absolutely done in the Doric order. The Ionic order is capped off by these two volutes. The columns are also thinner, they're taller, they're much more graceful, so we say it's more of a feminine style. And we see this when it's adorned on the facades of the temples to the goddesses, such as Athena. But the most famous is the Corinthian style. And the Greeks prized this style. It was used very much on the most important areas of a temple, which is on the inside. But when the Romans conquered the Greeks, the Romans put this style everywhere, including along the colonnade. So when we look at a sculpture or a temple like this, when we see that Corinthian columns along the colonnade, we know that this is created from the Roman Empire, not the Greek Empire, even though this temple is at the foot of the Acropolis. And Revelers is one of my favorite works to put in because it is the first time we have an artist signing a work of art. Revelers is created by the Athenian artist Euthymides, and he would inscribe his works, Euthymides painted me. And there's only about six or eight works of his remaining in the world. The classical period is really where we know the Greek civilization, because this is where we have the most lifelike sculptures and the most outstanding works of art. Located off the Greek mainland is the island of Aegina, and here we have the temple of Aphaea. And this was built over a very specific time period of transition in terms of art. And we're particularly looking at the art that's going to be in the pediments on either side. So the pediments are this very low triangular area above the columns there, and they're going to hold sculpture. So this is the two different types of sculpture that we see. One is from the west end, and one is from the east end of the temple. And we can notice how on one side that was done in 490 BC, how archaic this sculpture is. The hair very abstract, the figure very much done in an ideal form, and we also have those almond eyes and that archaic smile to the mouth. Over on the other side, done only 10 years different, is this dying warrior, where we have this figure that looks a lot more lifelike, where you've got musculature, you've got individualized faces, you can see the strain he's using to pull himself up by his shield, 
we're using the spine as the axis in which to twist the body. The Riachi warrior is one of the few bronze sculptures that exist today from the Greek civilization because it was sunk in a storm, in a shipwreck basically, during a storm off of Riachi, Italy. And it was underwater for over 2,000 years. And it went through, of course, many, many years of restoration after that. But again, one of the few bronze sculptures that we have from this age, as most of them had been melted down and repurposed. Some of the other more famous works would be like the discus thrower and the spear bearer. And with this work, we can also see how very much there was a, a ratio of how these figures were created. That's why a lot of these sculptures look exactly the same. But we also have the term contraposto, where the hips and legs are in a different position than the shoulders and the head because one side of the body is tense and the other body is more relaxed. There's this weight shift. So we've got on this side, the upper body, the weight bearing side would be on our right side. And then the lower body, the weight bearing side would be on the left side. It's a much more natural way of creating the human body. There's dynamism and there's motion here. And it's very much more mimicking our human form. We see that also with the sculpture of Hermes and Dionysus. And these are sculptures that Renaissance artists such as Donatello and Michelangelo grab onto and bring this ideal forward after the Dark Ages entering into the Middle Renaissance. All right, so we're gonna look at the Acropolis next. And this is where some of the most important temples are in Greece. And of course, the very first temple to be constructed on top of the Acropolis was the Parthenon, dedicated to the goddess Athena Parthenos. And inside would have been this absolutely gigantic ivory and gold sculpture by Phidias. This is also the location where you would have the Elgin marbles in their original positions. About 40 feet away from the Parthenon is the Erechtheion. And here we can see it is the Ionic uh, order. And we also have to the far left, this porch of Caryatids. And they're really cool. They are not original. Um, most of them have been, are now in museums and we have replicas here. And our final phase of Greek art is the Hellenistic Age, which dates to 323 BC, which is beginning with the death of Alexander the Great. And he expanded the Greek civilization beyond the borders of Greece all the way down into North Africa and almost to India through the Indus Valley. This is art that contains expressiveness as well as drama. And we can see what massive land holdings the Greek empire had at the death of Alexander. A couple of the works we'll look at is the Altar of Zeus in Pergamon which is located in Turkey. And this is that area below all the columns is called the Frieze. And it depicts the battle between the gods of Mount Olympus and the giants of earth. And some of these figures come spilling out onto the stairway and walkway. It's really impressive. We have Lawakawan and his sons. This is the priest who tries to warn the people of Troy not to bring the wooden horse inside the gates, but the gods wanted this to happen and Poseidon sends out a serpent to kill Lawakawan and his sons. We have the Gaelic chief who, instead of being captured by the enemy, kills himself and his wife. And the dying Gaul. 
which also shows uh, someone who is a barbarian, someone who has rough uh, hair and facial hair, but also um, the unideal portion of this figure. He's very individualized. A broken sword uh, by his hand, he's bleeding from his chest wound as well as his leg, and again, a very theatrical type of sculpture. Our final section before we get to the midterm was Etruscan art. And here, keep in mind that this came from the Tuscany region in Italy. They were descendants of the Villanovans who had uh, lived in Italy since the Bronze Age. And they're going to be integrated into Roman society. Their language is still not fully deciphered. But what's really cool about this group of individuals is some of their structures. Unfortunately, none of them exist, but we do have Roman writings that tell us about them. And the Etruscan temples were kind of similar in shape to Greek temples, kind of that rectangular uh, shape to them. However, they were accessed by a single flight of stairs, but then there was this portico or porch area and then you would have three sections of the temple, which would be the rooms of the gods. The columns, instead of marble, they would be made of wood. The roof also made of wood and then tile put on top of that. But above that were all these wonderful sculptures. And one of them is the Apollo of Ve. And this is a life-size sculpture, one of the few sculptures remaining from this time period because it is made out of terracotta. So these are very ephemeral objects or mediums that the Etruscans are working with. The Etruscans also had the same period such as Orientalizing, Archaic, Classical, and Hellenistic. We talked about the tumuli, which were the semi above ground tombs and they were positioned near one another. They're kind of like one of those large Tholos tombs, but these ones not only had a little bit of area above the ground, you would step down into them. And here, uh, sometimes they would be adorned by paintings on the wall, but in this one, this is the Tomb of the Reliefs, and so you would have these wonderful relief carvings, everything that the deceased would need in the afterlife. Another work made from terracotta is the sarcophagus with the reclining couple. This is a banqueting couch that you would normally eat in a reclined position. Um, the women, of course, were treated much better in Etruscan society. These are not individualized. In fact, when we focus in on the gentleman's face, um, the beard looks very much like a, a shovel in a way. Um, so these are very common geometric forms making up these figures. There, were, um, there was a cinerary jar found in this work with ashes. We're not sure if they were uh, a single person's ashes or maybe both individuals. But they are very animated and definitely happy to see us. The Capitoline Wolf, um, this is an Etruscan bronze work and very few bronzes uh, escaped the, uh, the age, but the sculptures underneath of Romulus and Remus, those were made during the Renaissance age and placed here. And finally, the Aulus Metulus, which is known as the orator. It is a full life-size bronze sculpture the figure is dressed as a Roman. He has a very Republican haircut. And, um, but the inscription on the toga is that of, uh, of the Etruscan writing. And by the first century BC, the Romans had curtailed Etruscan power, unified Italy, and established an empire that encompassed the entire Mediterranean region. And we'll be focusing on the Romans after the midterm and best of luck on that exam.